America, my name is Aramio Yosef from Pong. I come to you live every Thursday about this time. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about Brett Favre and Southern governance, because it's not obvious that Brett Favre's situation, wherein he found a way to use all of his political connections to secure welfare funds in order to um, build a volleyball stadium for his daughter's team at Southern Mississippi, in which they're both alum. Um, uh, both Favre and his daughter went to Southern Mississippi. And what does that have to do with racism and Southern governance? Well, you have to understand why weren't those funds allocated the way they should have been to people who needed it. And I, the thesis is going to be that in the South, the priority is so much making sure that black people stay vulnerable and poor, and poor that any program that could substantively empower them the political mandate is to somehow kill it. Yet you have to pretend that we're part of, we're, we're a democracy, not an internal colony, right? So that's why the people in Jackson, Mississippi have, um, you know, poo colored water and Brett Favre is able to loot the state treasury for the sake of his daughter's volleyball not even a black sport, volleyball. Uh, his daughter's volleyball aspirations and stadium, right? That is possible because a block grant, and Clinton knew this when he turned welfare into block grants. You give a block grant to the state, the state decides how to do it. And then the state decides that its priority is making sure that black people within the state and Mississippi's large and poor black population within the state doesn't ever get empowered because make no mistake, the first mandate of U.S. democracy, especially in the South, is making sure you do not empower black people and black communities on a par with their with their white counterparts. So in for the sake of making sure that uh, black people do not ever, ever have the economic conditions to actually be political equals, uh, Mississippi's not going to make sure that that welfare gets out to the, the poor blacks who need it. Right, so you have this load of money. So, and 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 Brett Favre went after that money be, for the same reason Willie Sutton robbed banks, <laughs> or went after welfare because the same reason Willie Sutton robbed banks because that's where the money is. So you had this big pot of money where, where that was always going to be do something other than empower black people because that's a state mandate at the state legislature. Because make no mistake, the Mississippi State Legislature, you're dealing with Klan, so they have to find a way to spend that money short or in any other literally any other way than substantively empowering black people and so that's where you know nancy knew in her charters charter uh uh charter school scam and brett Favre and his volleyball um aspirations for his daughter that's where all of this comes from that that political mandate that we don't talk about that whatever government does it cannot empower black communities but we have to pretend that we're, democ we're, we're a democracy. So we have this money that's earmarked for everything. It's actually earmarked for not empowering black communities. That's what, that's what the block, that's what the welfare black, uh, grant was blocked, um, was blocked for, was earmarked for. That's what the block grant did. It had to, had, whatever it did, it had to make sure it didn't, earmark, it didn't substantively empower black communities. And one way to not substantively empower black communities is to spend that money on a, a volleyball stadium. And with that, I will hit the beat. To the beat, y'all. Uh, yeah. Sound good to me. Never change the ways for the world or the government. If it was the president, then I would state facts. You leave it up to me, I paint the White House black and it can feature in your front. To the beat, y'all. So once again, when you give a block grant to a state like Mississippi, it doesn't matter what it's for. What it's, what it's really for is for to keep up the veneer of democracy while not empowering black people. If they actually spent that money to empower black people, you know, people would lose seats. Like they would have, a, the state would have an existential crisis. The Southern way of life is inconsistent with black people, especially black communities wielding power on a par with their white counterparts. Um, I suspect that there are quite a few six-figure Negroes in Mississippi, and their job, primarily, I strongly suspect, is controlling other black people. 
because that's the best job there is for uh, for a black person in America is to be to manage other <laughs> to be an overseer of black people for white people. So what I want to say is that you can't talk about the Favre scandal without talking about why there was so much money lying around in the welfare rolls in Mississippi, a state that is notoriously poor and notoriously black, right? And the reason why the money was um, lying around was because they could not risk empowering black people, even with welfare. Right, because that is the prime directive of the state legislature. Do everything short of empowering your black residents because the Southern way of life depends on black residents being vulnerable to white power structures. Right? That's why we don't care about, you know, the, the water in Mississippi, in Jackson. I mean, that should be a national problem. There should be no, that's like National Guard or Army Corps of Engineers stuff. That should just like secure water as a national right, as a, as a right, and unsafe living conditions. That's like the Department, Federal Department of Public Health. That's that's like an executive action that the Army Corps of Engineers go in and fix that. But no, um, because of the Southern way of life depends upon black people being vulnerable. One way to be vulnerable is to have brown water coming out of your pipes, and have a billion dollar problem with a few million dollar budget to to fix it, right? So you have to understand that the Southern way of life depends on black poverty, but with the veneer of democratic governance, right? So we have to have the veneer that we, could, we can wield power on a part with, with our white counterparts and all of the formal programs so that might, that might be the case. But then make, the money was never going to go to black people if it was going to empower black people. Like that was not ever going to happen. That's why the, Clinton gave it to the states because the because sta Clinton knew when he gave that money to the states it was going to go to something else. <laughs> Whatever it was going to go to, um, we, it was not going to go to um, empowering black people. That's when Clinton's welfare reform, um, and that's why we act surprised that the money was there to be looted. But that's. Like that was the deal Clinton struck. I'll let you create this treasure chest that you will do what you feel is appropriate with, with respect to well, the welfare of your state. And uh, knowing that that was going to be doled down in a way that was inconsistent with actually securing black people, the economic conditions of political equality uh, so they can participate in their state and civil and family governance on a par with their white counterparts. Because the Southern way of life depends upon black degradation, right? And Clinton wasn't going to mess that up with his welfare reform. So you have to understand the racial politics of Mississippi if you want to understand how Favre's grift made it so far and why it was like, and why welfare in a poor state, why the welfare rolls were the right place to look because that money was earmarked for anything except empowering black people and building a volleyball stadium is a lot of things. One thing that it is not is <laughs> um, uh, you know, good for Negroes. So what so I want to talk to you about that. I wanted to clarify, because a lot of people are talking about Favre as like without the customs and activities and the laws that enables Favre's grift to go and go so smoothly. But it's because everybody knows that public, men, public monies in Mississippi are even ones empowered to secure democracy and the economic conditions of freedom in the United States are also earmarked to make sure that the racial hierarchy stays and vulnerability stays. And black people are vulnerable because they're broke. And in a nation where everything costs money, if you don't have money, you're vulnerable because you're broke. Right? So I'm glad I cleared that up. Thank you. Understand that's the case. Understand that people talk about, and this is for Brett, uh, Brett Favre's daughter. For Brett Favre's daughter. Right? So what does it mean that, like, so people say, like, well, you know, 
I don't understand why women vote for patriarchy because patriarchy pays for your volleyball stadium. <laughs> That's why, like, um, like you go to any like nice tennis court in the middle of the day, you'll see a lot of tennis wives who vote for Republicans. And until like liberal feminists understand that conservative white women are not confused about which which side of the how their bread is buttered, um, then like you're not going to understand why I'm not the greatest. I'm not. I'm not a feminist. Because I don't think, I, I think gender is very complicated. It's complicated by race and it's complicated by, um, I don't think there's a universal womanhood. I don't think the essential workers, I don't think, I don't think white women and their nannies have that much in common. I, 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 I do not think that. I do not think the tennis wives and their nannies have that much in common. And the people who say that they're all oppressed by men, like, I don't, I don't know. I, I have a hard time believing that that's true. Uh, so next week, I'm going to talk a little bit about fatherhood. There's this guy, Robert Reeves, who wrote a book about boys and men. It turns out the boys and men are not doing so hot, especially post-pandemic, but pretty much in general, the boys and men are not doing so well. Anybody, like, I don't know what story we had to tell ourselves that, that, that Zoom school was going to be appropriate. I pulled my kids out of Zoom school. I mean, out of school as soon as I heard that they was closing and going to Zoom school, and I homeschooled them myself. So as you can imagine, they are, everything is above level, and they're wonderful because I would not submit them to that trash. But other people who are essential workers, the essential workers, the backbone of a community, it turns out that you know, their kids didn't learn anything for two years because Zoom school didn't work. It only worked if you had like, a parent who was a stay-at-home parent who like, monitored them. And if they were going to do that, they should have just pulled them out. So Zoom school was a disaster, except for like, very fastidious young women who did well, and not their brothers. <laughs> And, and people who had like mom upstairs making lunch for them while they were on Zoom school. And that was just not a lot of black people, especially U.S. essential workers that we were supposed to respect so much, but it turns out we totally screwed their kids and without a care. So the boys are not doing so right. It turns out that the top 10% of schools in the nation, two thirds of them are women. Now I figured this out. I'm going to tell you a little story about, I'll probably tell the story again next week. Cause I, it's when I figured out something was going on. So I, I played in a lot of orchestras when I was in high school, like university or uh, not university orchestras, community orchestras, and just a lot of, a lot of, a lot of orchestras when I was in high school. And one thing I noticed with the youth orchestras is that the concert master would be a guy and maybe there'd be one or two other guys in the top, like two chairs, but then the rest of the sections, and these were high quality orchestras would be women. Like, there'd be one or two guys, um, uh, and this was in all the strings, uh, violin, violas, and cellos. Cellos, maybe a few more men. But I, I noticed that the violins, violas, um, the, the top chairs were guys and all the others were women. And then, and so I wasn't actually, so I was wondering that, like, I wonder if this dynamic is actually writ large to society. So everyone says, like, well, you know, the CEO of this many companies are guys, but then you realize, like, oh, <laughs> There are a lot of women involved. So women are, it turns out women are doing very well in school. This, this ends up with the idea that women, it turns out, are doing very well in school. The top 10% of, of classes throughout the United States, two-thirds of the people are women. Two-thirds are young girls. And I've heard in no small, among the whites, I've heard a lot of, you know, this Zoom school worked for my daughter, but my son, it did not work. I wonder why. And, and, and everyone's just kind of confused about why that didn't work. But because you, you, like, we are, we're going to start understanding education as we're going to feminize education such that to, be, to do well in school is to become a trait of girls, especially upper class girls, in a way that's like not particularly good for anybody. Um, uh, yeah. But, you know, I'll talk a little bit about this next week when I, when I go into more detail on the book, uh, the Robert Reeves book. But first of all, a lot of this is, I mean, I'll give you a nugget. We need to decouple fatherhood from breadwinning. There are lots of ways to be a father. Not all of them are breadwinning. For example, LaVar Ball, I, I, it turns out LaMelo Anthony, LaMelo La Ball got uh, picked up by the Charlotte Hornets, which means LaVar Ball, that black man, succeeded in getting all three of his sons into the NBA. I don't know what you want to say about him if he's not your type of Negro, if he is not, if he's not your cup of tea. But that man got all three of his sons in the NBA. And he was a mediocre basketball player 
and like a mediocre college, not a mediocre, he was a college athlete, but like, you know, he wasn't great. But he got all three of his sons, and that's that's becoming a second generation game. You look at the basketball, you look at professional basketball now, and you got a lot of like second and third generation kids. So he figured out a way to think through and hustle through to get all three of his sons into the NBA. So LeVar Ball, you go ahead, black man. You did a whole thing. But uh, next week, I'm going to talk about why we have to decouple fatherhood from breadwinning. And black people have already always decoupled fatherhood from breadwinning because if you're on the working class side, like, like anybody who doesn't know that black women earn as much as black women, black men, like hasn't been around black people too much. <laughs> like, like this whole idea that men should be breadwinners that's white nonsense um like black from staples on through Tommy, Tommy Curry you, you'll find that the black households have always been more egalitarian and one of the reasons why there was such a high um divorce rate in black households is because a lot of black women started listening to some white nonsense and you know started putting their aspirations putting white aspirations on their black man and that, you know, it ended up in divorce. It ended up in divorce. So you need to decouple fatherhood from breadwinning. And that's good. And now you need to do it for the whites. The blacks have always done it. Um, and we got shamed for doing it. But now you got to do it for the whites because white guys aren't earning as much as their uh, lady counterparts. Um, they're not doing, so you de decouple and you got to figure out what fatherhood means, which uh, I... You know, you can say what you want about the funky academic, but I do that part of the game pretty well. And I talk about it a lot in school. I got my kids' soccer game today. I, uh, all right, so I'll give you a little nugget before we leave. A lot of people don't know. Nobody taught me because my mom kicked out my dad, um, you know, when I was in second grade. I didn't start playing soccer until third grade, and I didn't really play that regularly because, you know, not a lot of parents would get me to, to practices until I got to high school. But... What you're trying to do is, in most ball sports in general, but what you're trying to do, especially in talking about basketball too, is you want your defender, if you're on offense, you want your defender to have to um, uh, turn directions across their body. You want to use their body weight against them. You can say the same thing about judo or aikido. You, you want to use their body weight against them. So their body weight is part of your arsenal. You want them going one way, and then you turn with the other, so they have to turn all the way around against their body weight to chase you. And that gives you a step up. And if you have any sort of speed, that step is all you need in order to beat them. So you want to put them in a position so that they have to turn against their body. And if they can turn against their body, like, you won. You won. Right? So I was, I was talking to that about uh, um, for the last week. I've been working on that with my nine-year-old about you know i'd run up to her faced one way and i said all right so which way do you go and she said to your weak side and that's you know the side to your butt the side to my back and my butt all right and then um but that's just that's just you know a fundamental principle of ball sport i used to think and i'll tell you i used to think when i was playing soccer a lot when i was young and i and i wasn't scared of lateral movement like i am right now as a man in my 40s I don't movements for people under 40. I'm, I've heard too many weird Achilles rips that I do not want to go out like a statistic. Um, that, you, uh, that you just have to confuse the defender. So I do all these fancy moves and use my speed in all these ways. But no, you just have to get the um, defender to move against their body weight. And then uh, that gives you the step you need. So my nine-year-old now has um, an advantage that I didn't figure out until I was deep into my 20s. <laughs> On the downside, uh, when I was slow and I had to figure out some different ways to get by defenders because I'd lost a step. And, you know, that's what fathers can do. So, yeah, you want to turn your defender and then get them moving backwards or have to spin across their body um, to get you, to chase you. And then that gives you a step advantage. And that's pretty much the whole, whole game in 1v1. That's the first principle of like 1v1 1B, 1B1 offense. Anyway, thank you for your time. Um, next week, we'll talk a lot more about fatherhood and boys and how, like, there's a reason why a lot of people aren't identifying as feminists. But everybody wants equality. Nobody's against equality. It's funny, because now that we find out that when women are given equal opportunity in school, they do better in school, maybe there's something structurally, they have a structural advantage in school. 
in the system of the schools. It might be that all the teachers are women. <laughs> like, I don't know if, uh, yeah. So we need to start thinking about maybe, right. Maybe it's the case that women have a structural advantage in school. I will say that, um, yeah. Anyway, thank you for your time. I will talk to you. And this is, you know, among the whites, blacks, it's, it's a little bit more complicated um, because nobody has a structural advantage. Those schools are, those are all, both are hostile to um, the black mind, <laughs> uh, all in, like most institutions in America. Anyway, thank you very much. I will talk to you later and I'll see you next week.